So um, I'm a former Cisco employee. It feels familiar. Uh, I used to work in these buildings. Um, they're very well maintained. <laughs> Excellent buildings. Um, and uh, I have a very important question I have to start off with. Chicago Cubs have not won a World Series since 1908. Cleveland Indians haven't won one since 1948. So who do you guys think is going to win? Show hands for Chicago Cubs and for the Indians. Okay, now who do you want to win? I want to see if there's consistency here. Who wants to see the Cubs win? Yeah, who wants to see the Indians win? Okay, so the sympathy is really coming out here for the Cubs. Yeah, what a pathetic team for so many years. Okay, so uh, I do want to talk about Internet of Things, and I started creating this presentation uh, and realized that if I just jump right into the IoT stuff, you won't have any idea of what um, our product is or what Inverit is, because many of you may not be familiar with us. We're a smaller company, but uh, you're going to start hearing more because I run marketing. <laughs> and so we're going to start getting the word out um, rapidly here. Um, let see if I can get this slide to go forward. Oh, it's a technical thing. So I want to start off by talking about indoor air quality, uh, which you guys are all experts on. Um, and uh, I'm becoming an expert. I've been most of my career in the telecom industry. But, um, you know, what, uh, is, as you know, commercial buildings use a lot of outside air to maintain indoor air quality. Uh, you know, the, the ventilation rate procedures, you've got air blowing in all the time. It's kind of like having a, a window open there, but probably having a window open on every floor with a fan blowing the air into the, into the building. And that is to maintain the air quality inside the building. Uh, you are uh, typically replacing the air inside the building multiple times a day. We've seen as high as 20 times in a day. Um, so, you know, you, you hear the old phrase like, you know, don't go boil the ocean. This is kind of like heating the atmosphere, you know. It's like you're trying to heat so much air during the winter and cool so much during the summer. It's really inefficient practice. And, um, you know, the industry has recognized this and tried to address it. Um, and so some of the common things you see would be like demand control ventilation, where you reduce the ventilation based on lower occupancy in the building, because you have lower occupancy, you have lower CO2, you don't necessarily need as much ventilation. Uh, but it does not address the building contaminants, um, so you still need to have a fair amount of ventilation for that. And the other aspect is um, you don't change the peak HVAC capacity. So on a hot afternoon, you know, when it's at its peak temperature, it's also typically in an office building your peak occupancy. And so you still have to uh, you know, fully ventilate that building on that hot, humid uh, afternoon. Another technique, of course, is ERVs. Uh, you know, you're recovering energy from the uh, exhaust air and transferring that into the uh, outside air coming in. But there are some efficiency limitations. And so a new technology that's evolved is uh, HVAC load reduction, or HLR. And here you can actually reduce outside air by a significant amount. Um, typically 75%, uh, and that is really by cleaning the indoor air. Uh, it addresses all the contaminants inside the building, and it does allow you to reduce the peak uh, HVAC capacity. So you can use it you know, on a hot afternoon when you have uh, peak occupancy in your, in your building. And so um, it's a really a superior approach because you're, you're cleaning and then recycling the indoor air. And you know this is sort of the big trend, right? Everyone wants to recycle and reuse, and so why not with air? So you remove the molecular contaminants. Uh, that allows you to reduce the outside air for ventilation, and then that, that allows you to lower the energy costs and improve the air quality inside the building. Now, a common question I get is, I'm not familiar with this, is this ASHRAE compliant? And it actually certainly is. So ASHRAE has a couple ways that you can uh, manage uh, air quality. One is through uh, something called the ventilation rate procedure, which is where you just blow in lots of outside air. And the other method is called the indoor air quality procedure. And uh, this is what is uh, the method for implementing that. So who's selling HVAC load reduction technology? Uh, no surprise, we are. Define molecular because. From an indoor yeah. air quality concern, the, the biggest issue right now that's coming forth is the bacteria and the virus shed by the occupants. 
And so then you're dealing with the geometry of airflow through the space to isolate that individual. To, to what extent are viruses and bacteria included in the um, contaminants that are being dealt with with this type of system? Yeah, so thanks for that question. I should clarify. So. There are some technologies out there that will try to address bacteria. Uh, this one does not specifically do that. It addresses um, more office building contaminants like carbon dioxide, VOCs, formaldehyde. Those are kind of the main ones that uh, um, are defined. And those are what are defined in ASHRAE as the contaminants of concern within uh, those types of buildings. You would probably not use this for like the uh, operating room or something like that. Uh, so, um, you're probably familiar with York. Uh, they have uh, adopted this technology, and um, you know, uh, it's uh, come. You can get it in a variety of form factors. Rooftop units are also available. Um, and what I brought with me here today is an example of a sorbent cartridge. Um, inside of this is. Uh, this uh, sandy material, you see the picture there, it's, it, uh, I meant to bring some actually, uh, so you can sort of feel it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, non-toxic um, silica that basically uh, has the properties of adsorbing uh, with, uh, of these molecular contaminants. Adsorbing means that the, when the molecules come through it, they actually kind of adhere or stick to it. Um, and so it captures, like I mentioned, carbon dioxide, VOCs, and formaldehyde. Um, it was developed um, in collaboration with major universities and labs, some fairly significant names there, like MIT, and, uh, USC, and Berkeley Lab. Um, it's not actually a new technology. It's been around for a long time. So think about a spacecraft or a submarine. They have no outside air available to them. So this is really... Um, what we've done is taken a technology that's been around for a long time, but was extremely expensive. <laughs> Think about your nuclear submarines and your spacecraft, they have fairly large budgets. Uh, most commercial buildings don't have those kind of budgets, and so um, we've uh, adopted, the, or adapted the, uh, the technology to make it viable for you know, commercial uh, buildings. How it works is, um, you uh, basically hook up a, an HLR uh, on the return side of an air handler, and uh, you've got a slipstream of return air that's being scrubbed. Um, the HLR will uh, control the outside air intake, um, uh, although still maintaining positive pressure in the building, you can't reduce it too much. Um, and so you're doing ongoing scrubbing of the uh, air, and so that maintains the indoor air quality. It doesn't allow the CO2 to get too high. It keeps the formaldehyde and VOCs at a, at a low, uh, safe level. And so that's how we uh, reduce 75% of outside air during you know, hot summer and cold winter days. Um, now, what's inside a typical HLR? And they're not all the same, but ours looks like this, and um, it's uh, you know it's got. Some fans in there to blow the air through uh, uh, a cartridge bank, and so the assortment cartridges slide in, in kind of an alternating V shape. And um, there's also a heater in there, which I'll explain later why we have that. And then there's a wireless connection. It's going to be more important for this talk because that's uh, for our Internet of Things connection. Um, and then there's a variety of sensors. I pointed out a few, but there's actually uh, a lot more than just those uh, couple that are highlighted there. And so um, what happens is you have, uh, uh, during the sorption mode, which is when we're cleaning the air, um, air from the return duct is blown into the system, goes through the sorbent cartridges, and then out to the air handler to be uh, uh, cooled. And so um, the other nice thing about this is there's zero byproducts. There are some like sketchy products out there that try and claim to clean the air, but they have some fairly dangerous byproducts associated with them. So there's nothing that comes out into the, uh, you know, there's no additional contaminants coming that are being produced by the cleaning process, because all we're doing is taking those molecules and having them adhere to the, uh, to the sorbent material. Um, now, uh, the sorbents periodically, uh, the, you know, they, they uh, 
fill up, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and so they reach their capacity. And so you regenerate them with heat. And so this is a pretty simple process. Um, it's a two-step process. The first one is you uh, close all the dampers, and we have that heater in there, and that warms up the air inside the system. We heat it to about 50 to 60 degrees C, and what that causes is the molecules let go of the sorbent material. And so now they're inside, blowing around, and what we do is then open up the what we call our regeneration ducts, and you flush those contaminants outside. And so uh, when the regeneration dampers open, uh, the, uh, the contaminants are basically blown out through the exhaust vent. And so that's typically done, you know, uh, sometimes, depends on the building, sometimes once a day, sometimes a couple times a day, um, just depends on the, uh, on the type of building. Um, it's actually starting to get some very uh, fast uh, industry recognition uh, really rapidly growing. So. Like I mentioned before, ASHRAE has, uh, has uh, confirmed that it is compliant with their standard. Uh, they did a, f a formal interpretation was published in January of 2015. Uh, it is recognized by the USGBC. Um, they started a pilot program in 2014. Uh, we just had actually a customer achieve nine lead credits for implementing uh, HLRs, which is, as you know, quite a few. And that was only for the air quality um, credits didn't include anything related. They didn't actually submit for the energy saving credits yet. So fairly significant impact there if you're trying to get uh, lead certification for your uh, clients uh, or for your building. Um, it's also endorsed by the Department of Energy. They've actually given us millions of dollars to go um, help fund projects. So if you've got a building that uh, is, you know, I think might be a good fit for this, we, um, we might be able to get some of that money for you. And then the utilities have jumped on board as well. So uh, MassSave recently came out recommending, um, yeah, the MTAC uh, or Massachusetts Technical Assessment Committee came out and recommended this technology and so it's eligible for rebates. Con Edison uh, has been offering rebates on it as well. So those are, and those are just a couple of the local guys um, that I thought would be relevant to you. And then um, the GSA has a program called the Green Proving Ground. Uh, which you may be familiar with. Uh, it's a highly selective program where they uh, choose energy efficiency technologies that they think will be promising for their federal uh, buildings. Uh, and they've selected us, and so we're uh, currently in testing with them. And it really is an exciting opportunity because it, really, it truly opens the door to broad adoption by the GSA, which, of course, is, um, manages more real estate than anyone else in the U.S., um, so, uh, and then, you know, the client customer base is actually growing pretty quickly too. Um, it, it ranges from office buildings, to universities, libraries, classrooms, uh, retail. Um, we've got, uh, you see there's a blank line there. That's because those are the confidential customers I had to delete because those can only be shared under like a specific NDA. But, um, Sometimes it's hard to get customers to talk, but we've got a lot of uh, pretty large companies that are now, you know, starting to use this technology. Um, so why are they using it? Uh, you know, it could be for air quality reasons, but a lot of it's usually for the economics. Um, the typical annual savings is in the 20 to 30 percent range. The peak savings are routine, routinely above 40 percent. Because think about it again, a really hot, humid summer day, you've got all that outdoor air coming in. Um, now you can dramatically reduce it. Yeah, I'm just saying 20 to 35% of what? Of the uh, HVAC uh, energy spend. So we put energy meters on like the chillers, and uh, that's primarily what we measure is the uh, reduction in the chiller energy consumption. And some of these have been confirmed with that by NREL, National uh, Renewable Energy Labs, government funded organization that uh, you know, does um, does these measurements. And so uh, uh, it's it's pretty compelling savings. The other thing is, so that, that's why the payback is, you know, just roughly uh, one and a half to three years, again, it depends on the building. If it's new construction or like a replacement of uh, HVAC equipment, the payback period is immediate because um, you can re actually reduce your capacity of your HVAC system. So that peak savings of uh, 40% effectively means that your 
HVAC capacity could be 40% less. Just to help you out with that savings, that's savings on your indoor air, your, excuse me, your outdoor air incoming. So what your avoided cost is, you bring in X amount of CFM in New England as an example, you have to heat and you have to cool that and you have to dehumidify it. The less outdoor air you bring in, that's where those savings are based on. Yeah. But it's a percentage of the uh, and it's a percentage of the overall HVAC energy consumption. Usually we're measuring just the chiller uh, energy consumption. So um, in a new construction environment, you know, it's the economics are particularly uh, um, powerful because not only do you have the energy savings, you know, on the, the left hand side here where you have um, you know you're just you're using less energy and so you're saving on your utility bill, but you can downsize your chillers, your boilers, your out there units. That also sometimes allows you to reduce the amount of ducts, piping, shafts, electrical, and so then you're reducing your capex up front as well as your maintenance. So it's pretty significant. And um, and you know that's why I think Johnson Controls has really adopted this technology and you're gonna hear a lot more from them um, about it as well. So um, so that's kind of the basics of what HLR is, and uh, hopefully you're getting a two for one here because some of you may not have, I know some of you are already familiar with it um, and have already adopted it, so hats off to you guys for adopting new technologies and keeping abreast of those things. Some of you are maybe new to it. Um, but I know you came here also to learn about Internet of Things, and so now that you've kind of got the basics of what it's doing, uh, I wanted to talk about how we use the Internet of Things technology uh, as part of the HLR solution, at least from Invarid. So um, there's three components. We use state-of-the-art sensors for monitoring the air. Uh, there's wireless connectivity, um, and that's our wireless uh, modem antenna. And then we have a cloud-based service uh, where you can um, you know, log on via any of your standard web browsers or mobile devices and, uh, and view any HLR. Uh, that you have access to. And so it really enables anytime, anywhere uh, management of uh, HLRs, but also of your building's indoor air quality. So the sensors, uh, we've got a lot of different sensors. There's temperature, humidity sensors all around in various locations, uh, input, output, cartridge bank. We're also looking at outside duct uh, sensor temperatures and humidity and the supply. Um, we also have other connections to like the outdoor air uh, dampers, uh, both uh, for control as well as monitoring the position of it, um, and also looking at the air handling status. Um, we uh, sometimes we have direct connections. Other sometimes buildings have uh, a BMS with BACnet. We can also integrate to a BMS using BACnet um, for those kind of uh, interfaces. And so using all of that information, we have some advanced algorithms that are uh, used to optimize the energy savings and the indoor air quality. And so these sensors help us determine, you know, when should we be cleaning the air? When should we do a regeneration? Uh, when should we just be in idle mode? Um, and so that's, uh, uh, and when should the building go into an economizer mode? So in that case, you want the outside air to come in. Um, so there's uh, a pretty sophisticated uh, software associated with this. Um, now, while that's going on, we also have uh, connectivity back to our cloud services. And um, today, uh, we primarily use cellular connections, uh, 3G, 4G connectivity. Um, and that is the, the main reason for that is because they have just coverage everywhere, pretty much. Um, the main challenge with LoRa is uh, is that it's not everywhere. We would like it to be because it would be far more cost effective than the cellular modems as well as um, the service fees that we have to pay for the cellular connectivity. But um, we use what's sort of available. And um, someone asked a question earlier about security. We totally agree. Uh, so we use uh, secure encrypted connections from each HLR. Uh, over the internet back to our cloud services, which are hosted in the Amazon cloud. Um, and so uh, that's a security connection. And then the, you know, you as a customer uh, using your device can establish a secure connection using, you know, standard HTTPS. 
um, to our cloud services to get access to all of the uh, metrics that we're collecting, <laughs> primarily on the air quality. Now, uh, that's not to say we don't have uh, LoRa capabilities. So if you've got a campus uh, with a variety of HLRs around the campus, um, we do have the option to interconnect them via a LoRa gateway, which then would backhaul to a uh, cell tower. Um, and so in that way, we can reduce the number of cellular connections for that campus, uh, save a little bit of money by using the LoRa technology. Um, and you still have your secure connection, you know, from the HLR all the way back to the uh, the cloud services uh, AWS. But um, in this case, you know, we reduce the number of those cellular connections. And so we look at LoRa as a very promising technology. Um, the only issue for us is it's not always everyone we want to be. And um, like uh, like uh, Brad mentioned, you know, you, to get something put up on a cell tower, it's not a trivial thing. <clears throat> So with this uh, connectivity, you can log into our cloud services, and you can look at um, pretty much anything that's coming out of those sensors. So the temperature and humidity information, but also the air quality. So you can look at carbon dioxide levels. Um, here, what you can see in this chart is this is the input CO2 coming into the HLR. This is what's coming out of the HLR. Yeah, that right. Uh, so you can see it's coming out at a reduced level, and by doing this, it maintains the carbon dioxide uh, at a lower level than it would be, otherwise it'd be sort of just shooting up. Um, and because we're cleaning that indoor air of these contaminants, you don't have to bring in so much outside air, and that's where the energy savings comes from. Um, you can see here these spikes, this is when we did a regeneration. So um, when we regenerate uh, the sensor data, you know, it goes way up because you're actually keeping the air, you know, inside the system. And then, it, you know, like I said, it flushes out all those contaminants out through the exhaust, and then it goes back into the, uh, to the sorption mode. And so it starts cleaning again. So this gives you, uh, like I said, anytime, anywhere access to your building to look at indoor air quality. You can look at energy savings statistics. You can look at the status of the HLR. Uh, status of your outs outside air damper, um, temperature, humidity information, variety of things. Um, so, you know, we kind of very, very excited about this. Uh, we think indoor air quality is becoming a key metric for buildings. We see um, studies like this recent Dodge Analytics report that came out saying that building owners are starting to put more emphasis on it. There's a Harvard study that was published, uh, Harvard along with a few other major universities, showed CO2 levels directly impact cognitive performance. It was shocking, actually. They, they studied these, uh, uh, they did this study, and I, it, they literally saw a doubling in cognitive performance by bringing the CO2 levels lower. Um, and this was, you know, not at astronomical levels of CO2. It was like bringing it from like you know, 1,400 parts per million to 700 parts per million people were like double the cognitive performance. Um, so we see actually there is a, a tech company, um, a very large one, uh, that is uh, planning to implement uh, HLRs very shortly that um, uh, is actually using indoor air quality as like a competitive advantage. You know, they see it as a way to give their employees an edge. Um, and so it's an interesting take on the whole uh, thing because yeah, never really heard of that before. Um, and I think monitoring indoor air quality via IoT is a perfect match. Um, you know, it, you think about the, the air we breathe, it's uh, it's so critical. And we kind of take it for granted. If you live in China, you don't take it for granted. I mean, they have huge issues with air quality, and um, it's a real crisis there. But here we kind of take it for granted, but there can be issues in buildings. In fact, there's a fair number of buildings that we've come across where they're closing the dampers and they're not cleaning the air. And so the air quality actually does get bad. And sometimes they're even getting complaints that you know, people are saying the air feels you know, stale or, you know, and you think about it, you know, when I get onto an airplane, I always feel so tired at the beginning of the flight. Well, that's because they close the doors and they haven't started ventilating right away. And so it's a carbon dioxide goes way up. You start to get you know, carbon dioxide poisoning. You start to fall asleep. Um, 
anyway, so it's very important, I think, to maintain air quality and, and being able to monitor it remotely, I think, is uh, a, a great um, way to leverage uh, Internet of Things. Um, so that's uh, just to wrap it up. I mean, you know, hopefully you learned a couple things here in addition to IoT. Uh, but HVAC load reduction is uh, has incredible ROI. It's great for you know the first cost savings, great energy savings. You can get util utility rebates. If you've got an aging HVAC system that you're wondering like oh, I got to replace the chiller, you know, it's because you need more capacity. This is actually a great solution. Far more cost effective. You're going to spend a couple hundred grand on a chiller, and these things are uh, you know inexpensive, very expensive, inexpensive compared to that. And then uh, you're going to get a better building. You know, you're going to be ASHRAE compliant. Uh, you're going to get lead credits. Uh, indoor air quality is going to improve. You're going to have the ability to monitor that and employee satisfaction. I mean, um, you know, just people like to have clean air. So uh, all good things. Um, at this point, if there's any questions, yeah. Well, as, as critical as monitoring carbon dioxide is for assessing ventilation performance, have you looked into also monitoring humidity levels because that's the number two component in terms of healthfulness of the indoor environment? Yeah, so I think I think we've got four different humidity sensors, you know, in different areas, so you can you can monitor the humidity. How do you size these? If you have an air handler with return air, thirty thousand CFM, what percentage of the of the CFM are you trying? Yeah, so there's a formula. There's a formula in the ASHRAE spec, and so we use that. And uh, basically, you know, I hate to give these rules of thumb, but I will because you've got to have them. So for like an office building, um, you know, we usually uh, hook one of these units up to like a twenty thousand CFM or thirty thousand CFM um, air handler. So we have like a, a high rise that's got 38 floors and there's um, one unit I think per floor. Because the high rise is I think around uh, 25,000 square feet of floor. Do you require the 3G connection for these systems or can they stand alone? Um, I think they can stand alone. Um, we, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know if I've ever even considered that, but uh, yeah, I think they can stand alone. I have to. You could probably run. Yeah, I mean, because the, the what happens is our, our cloud services they push down sort of um, any uh, sort of configuration or commands, and then once that's pushed down, it, it technically could run in an autonomous way. But you won't be able to monitor it, you know, unless you go to the system, you know, someone can hook into it directly. Does each one require a 3G connection or can they network together? So the networking together is really via the uh, the LoRa connection. And we've been looking at, you know, ways of having them communicate directly between each other. Um, we don't have that feature today. Um, but, you know, if you've got a specific use case, you'd be interested in learning more about that. So if you needed five of these in the building, you need five 3G connections. Yeah, normally we would have five 3G connections, or we'd use the LoRa gateway and one uh, 3G connection. So the LoRa gateway would aggregate those five, okay. and then um, we'd have one cellular connection. So, but um, yeah, the the, uh, the modems that we use, like the connections, are not particularly expensive. I think they're five bucks a month. The service fees. Um, so about 60 bucks a year for each connection. Well, one of the challenges you have with this is, let's say you take Cisco. They won't allow a cloud-based interface to their network. They won't do it. So the idea is having that on cellular works. Now, if we can get through Jasper protocols and a lot of the other protocols, that won't be an issue. Big concern you have out there and for any client is you have great instrumentation. The cellular network takes that off the building network, and there's no way for anybody to get into the client system. And this is a real problem. It's a, definitely a problem in the financial industry. It's a problem in the high-tech industry. And forget the government, because they're, they're, they're not going to allow it. So this cloud-based access, you get the data, you get to see the performance, and you eliminate the security concern. 
at some point we may be able to get through the Jasper requirements for putting it on the network and tying it into the building automation system. But if your building automation system is on your client's backbone, that's a problem. Now, if you have a proprietary building automation system and it's not connected to the client's network, then the only risk is someone could hack into the building automation system, shut off your chillers, and so on and so forth. But usually you try to put the protocol into the building automation system. So I hope that helps to answer that, that question. Thanks. Yeah. So if you're installing one of these on an air handler, you're basically disconnecting the building automation system from control of mixed air, all of your mixed air dampers, your exhaust air, your return air, your outdoor air dampers. So then this takes over the economizer control. So like I said, we can, we sometimes will tie in via BACnet to the BMS. Right, but if you don't do that BACnet tie-in, then you're basically removing that function of control from the building automation system. Well, you don't have to remove it entirely. So you would take control of the outside air damper, but um, they could be overrides set, uh, I, I believe, by the building management system, depending on the building management system, but I believe there's overrides so that when it wants to trigger, particularly economizer mode, or it wants to just open the damper completely, uh, that override can be done. cost of the system yeah so the um, uh, talk to your friendly salesperson I think uh, you know it, it, I think the um, uh, you know the cost is probably in like the uh, it, depends, on, on, depends your on the square, building. on your square footage of yeah. your solution um, essentially we're looking at paybacks right now of about three years before incentives so, and it also depends on how much stock work, you know, every HVAC system is different, every building is different, every air handler is different, even when they're supposed to be the same, they're not. Um, so, uh, we individually look at each application, we decide where that HLR needs to be, we, you know, we try to minimize the amount of duct work and that kind of thing. But it's not just a plug and play, um, because there's, you know, some customization that's involved and there's a significant amount of commissioning to make sure that the solution works. Brad, do you have a question? Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, are the uh, utility incentivized? So we've just recently had our MTAC started. And we just yeah. yeah, so M yeah, MTAC just recently made a, uh, recommended this as a technology, so it's eligible for rebates. So it's uh, going to be custom. Um, we've met with GRID. We're um, scheduled to meet with Eversource. We're getting ready to uh, to walk them through those counts and make sure everybody's happy and cozy, and then we'll be submitting some custom rebate applications in the next month or so for applications in New England. So, uh, coming back to the control question, so does does the unit require connection to the cloud for operating, like day-to-day -day operating, or is the operating logic self-contained in the system, like when to purge and when to eat? It's self-contained, so it uses the sensors to determine when to do cleaning and when to do regeneration. Um, usually, there's, I believe, you know, uh, I, I excuse my lack of technical knowledge. I believe there's some initial setup that uh, can either be done via the cloud or I'm, I'm sure it can be done locally. So, I suppose technically, you could you could keep it off the the wireless network um, if that was a mandatory requirement. But then you don't get to use Internet of Things. <laughs> yes. If it was um, off the network, does it have enough uh, local diagnostics? You know, the CO2 sensors, humidity sensors, they're notorious for getting out of calibration. I'm sure. I'm assuming the cloud is looking at that and recommending when maintenance is necessary. Yeah, so I think if you're not connected, uh, yeah, you wouldn't get some, you wouldn't get an alarm or an alert that like there's something funky going on um, because you've got no connectivity to it. Um, so um, that you know that would be one of the trade-offs is uh, you'd have to probably physically because if there's no there's no wireless connection to a device, you know, you have to physically go check it out. There's no other way around it. So you have to provide a service contract. Yeah, we usually do an annual maintenance um, that uh, uh, typically is to basically check out the sensors as well as then also um, 
we, we investigate the cartridges. And so if you're processing uh, particularly a lot of CO2 and uh, formaldehyde and other contaminants, the, uh, the cartridges can degrade they do degrade over time. So normally we would either replace them every year or every two years. So um, that's part of the service contract. And that's also calculated in those payback periods. You know, we don't add that on later. So we know that there's a cost there. Great. Mike, can you be here? Yeah, we can. Thank you very much.